And here we go. Oops, nope, I forgot the one step. I gotta share my share my screen. That's the step that works best. If I do it in the right order. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Pam and Don, everything okay? Excellent, okay. Then let me once again, I'm Jan Hasbrook here to welcome you to our second night together um, uh, to discuss the book that I wrote, Conquering Dyslexia. And I'll let my co-host talk about um, their role and rules and regs for tonight, the procedures. So the next couple of slides are for you folks. Well, of course we wanna welcome everybody to this second evening and we're thrilled to have all of you here once again. We had such a wonderful turnout uh, for our first session and for this one as well. This is a wonderful collaborative partnership. As you can see from this slide, um, it's all across the country. We have uh, Reed Washington who led um, our session last time with Jan um, yes. and uh, Yes, and tonight we have the honor of Pennsylvania kind of leading the way. That's the Reading League Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania branch of the International Dyslexia Association and Decoding Dyslexia PA. And leading the way uh, next time with Dr. Hasbrook will be the Reading League Wisconsin and Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin. So as you can see um, on the slide, um, we're facilitating chapter three. We're thrilled to be here with you this evening and looking forward to our friends in Wisconsin next time. Um, important information for you to know about. Um, every time that we're meeting, there will be a different Google, uh, excuse me, a different Zoom link. So make sure that you um, look to the Google uh, Drive and the Google link that you did to attend this session for the sessions following. Please fill out the Google form that will be put in the chat. There are continuing hours offered for all to in second series. We'll get you information about that towards the end. Um, and use the Q&A for any questions you have for Jan during the presentation. And what we've done is periodically, we've um, kind of stopped to check for questions or let Jan know when uh, questions are arising in the, um, in the chat. There are follow-up sessions every week following for parents and educators. So next Tuesday, there'll be a follow-up session for parents to discuss chapter three um, and decoding dyslexia of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania branch of IDA will facilitate that session. And then on Thursday evening, there'll be a follow-up session for educators and the Reading League, Reading League Pennsylvania will facilitate that session. So uh, we encourage you to come to that um, and, and join us. Um, is there another slide, Jan? I think there might be just with those dates. Oh, the, uh, yeah, the, I don't have the dates okay. in, oh, in that's my no slides, problem. yeah. So next Tuesday and next um, Thursday are the follow-ups, Tuesday for the parents and Thursday for the um, educators. And if you look to the, um, the Google doc, you'll see that information there. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I, I think that's it. And we'll get the okay. uh, handouts in the chat box. Excellent. So handouts are coming, everybody. Thank you. And I, I want to make it clear, although I've got my wonderful co-hosts um, and support group from Pennsylvania tonight, all technical glitches are on me. I can assure you of that. But so we're, we're in, we're, we're going. So I want to uh, get us started. So we have plenty of time to talk tonight, focusing in on chapter three, uh, which is the chapter focused on the, all of the assessments around dyslexia, but really targeting uh, the diagnosis of, of uh, this challenging disorder. And uh, I wanted to recognize that this is a challenging topic to try to discuss at any time in any way um, for a variety of reasons. It's so, so important uh, for families, for children, for parents, for teachers, for systems to get a good, clear diagnosis. Um, we all want that. We want it done as quickly as possible. And that makes it a challenge because that's not just simply not available to us. Nothing is quick and easy uh, in any way uh, around assessments with dyslexia. 
talking about assessments is challenging. There's lots of technical issues. There's lots of philosophical beliefs around assessments. Uh, you talk to school psychologists or special educators or dyslexia specialists, um, they may have all uh, been taught to approach this in a very different way. That's a challenge. Um, another challenge just simply is the fact that much of diagnosing someone with dyslexia is driven by uh, legislation that is specific to a state. Um, and I know we've had people attending uh, our book study from all over the country. Many, many states are represented. We have folks from Canada. We had last week, we had uh, folks uh, from uh, international settings. So that makes it a challenge too, because it's not one size fits all. Uh, and we're trying to do all of that in an hour. So uh, I'll encourage you again to follow up um, if we have specific questions. And of course, we'll have the wonderful facilitated conversations afterwards where you may be able to get some answers that are more specific to you. But I, I want to begin by acknowledging that uh, we've had some challenges facing us to, uh, as we discuss this. I, be I believe I mentioned last time, but I want to say it again, can't say it too much. I believe anybody who's interested in real in reading and learning a lot about it and participating in in-depth professional conversations around reading that the Spell Talk listserv is a, is a superb resource for that kind of thing. I use it a lot. And um, what uh, you, you'll find references to bits and pieces, nuggets of information Spell talk in various places in the book, but one of the people I quote often uh, who generously shares his time on spell talk quite often is Steve Dykstra from Wisconsin. Um, and he says many powerful, uh, wonderful things, and, and I agree with him so much of the time. And he said uh, something that encapsulates much of my understanding uh, beliefs and philosophy around assessment. And it goes back to that prevention um, issue that we talked about uh, last time and a theme that's throughout the Conquering Dyslexia book. And he said uh, on the Spell Talk listserv in April, 2019, early in learning, there is no reason to separate dyslexic children from kids who struggle to read for other reasons. They all need the same thing. Um, and this is a relatively new understanding that we've had um, for uh, many decades. There really was profound emotional beliefs around the fact that dyslexia, uh, the children with dyslexia really needed entirely different things. And, at, at, and we know that they may need more intensive instruction, all of those things that we'll talk about next time. But the, uh, the evidence is accumulating to uh, support what Steve Dykstra is saying here, that early on, especially, there is one way to train a brain uh, to become a reading brain. So all children need the same thing. We should intervene effectively, robustly with all of them. And especially at those early stages, not worry about who is or who is not dyslexic. Having said that, we all know, um, and I, mean, I already said, as a parent of someone who is dyslexic, hearing somewhat definitively that your child does have dyslexia. It just explains so many things, but our intervention should not be driven by a diagnosis and we should never wait for a diagnosis. And that's what we should be focused on. Um, page 53, those of you who are actually physically following along in the book, I do make that statement in this chapter that there is certainly that understandable urgent wish to diagnose dyslexia quickly and definitively, but such a measure does not exist. So I wanted to um, start this discussion about assessing dyslexia, because we're talking about assessing a reading ability. Um, and I certainly know that there's all levels of backgrounds and um, uh, levels of training and experience around this. We have parents with us here tonight who may understand reading more in a 
common sense way. So I wanted to very quickly give a little quick overview when, when we as professionals who deal with reading instruction and especially reading instruction with our students with dyslexia or other reading disorders, what we mean when we're talking about reading. Uh, my colleague Deb Blazer and I wrote a, a book, um, a different book other than Conquering Dyslexia, she and I collaborated on a book on fluency. And in that book, we uh, talked about reading as being a highly complex task that involves many interconnected and codependent linguistic processes that draw upon a variety of separate skills. Even that sentence is a mouthful. Reading is highly complex uh, and many different co-dependent processes and variables. And this next slide may visually represent that to you. No expectations here that this means anything to other uh, than the most uh, uh, highly informed people around the details around, uh, about reading. Um, and even then, this is a statistical analysis of reading uh, published in 2007 in the scientific studies of reading. It's, it's an attempt through statistical analysis using a, a multivariate analysis to identify um, components of reading uh, that have been identified through research as well as theoretical analysis and then show statistically how these things um, appear uh, at the beginning stages of reading, how they interact with each other, the numbers there that I don't expect you to see at all, there will not be a quiz on this. Uh, those numbers indicate the uh, uh, relative weight of contribution to these components to the ultimate outcome of reading, which is understanding reading comprehension. So that's just a quick picture and one way of looking at the complexity of reading. We're very grateful uh, that back in 1986, we had two researchers Goff and Tungmer, who proposed that we could take this incredibly complex thing called reading and look at it um, and take a simple view of it. Um, and everything that we read um, these days about reading often referred to the simple view of reading because it was such a brilliant analysis. They took this uh, formula, which I'll explain, the RC equals LC times D. What they meant by that in the simple view of reading, RC is the outcome of all reading, the reading, the reason we read, the reason we teach children to read is so that they can comprehend. And that outcome, is a product of language comprehension and decoding. Language comprehension meaning the ability to understand spoken language, which they're saying in their simple view, you have to have language comprehension to ultimately be able to comprehend reading. You also have to have decoding, the ability to decode and recognize words. Um, and it is the decoding side of things that our children with dyslexia generally struggle with. And in their idea of um, this, a product that these two things uh, are not additive, they have to interact with each other, that if the decoding skill is low, we might just assign a zero to that in a numeric uh, proposition that even if the language comprehension is adequate, say a, a level one, um, we know that uh, if we multiply these things, a zero uh, uh, effect in decoding, even if language is very high, is going to result in limited uh, reading comprehension. So both of those things need to be in place. Um, and if you are interested in reading more about this in a way that is translatable to most of us, you don't have to have uh, a double PhD in statistics and uh, reading cognition to understand the way that the simple view of reading is presented uh, at this website at, at reading rockets. Uh, so what essentially the simple view uh, concept is, is to take all of this complexity of reading and cover up some of it and just res uh, which ends results in a simple -er view of reading. So it's the reading comprehension that is the product of language comprehension and decoding. So uh, this is not a meaning that reading is simple, simply a simple view. It helps us, all of us, 
um, wrap our heads around what we're doing and what we need to teach and what we need to assess around reading. All of us in the reading field are also very grateful um, for Scarborough's work of translating all this complexity into this amazingly um, elegant, simple, uh, accurate, uh, research-based representation of the complexity of reading. And you'll find uh, this represented in a beautiful, uh, colorful graphic on page 59 of Conquering Dyslexia. But essentially it's the same idea as um, Goff and Tumner's, Tumner's uh, simple view of reading presented in a graphic format. So over on the right-hand side, that tightly woven rope where all of these component pieces come together um, is representing reading comprehension. The label there for that as skilled reading, the fluent execution and coordination of reading recognition and text comprehension. So then over at the side, there's the language comprehension um, of the simple view of reading and the word recognition. And what Scarborough has done is uh, sort of deconstruct the simple view into its component pieces. And those words that you see there, if you think back on that, um, uh, the graphic representation, the statistical representation, all of those things were there. So um, I'm going to stop here. This is one of our pause moments and see um, if I have deeply confused you or if you have any questions or comments or concerns before we proceed. Anything? I think, Come on. I think we're doing pretty well right now, Jan, so thank you. Very good. Okay. Gave me my chance to have a sip of water. That's always good. There you go. All right. Um, then on page 60 of Conquering Dyslexia, this quote, when we start really talking about, okay, if all of that is what reading is, then how do we go about assessing it? Um, and I start on page 60 by just saying, we've got to do this. Schools, the, the, the most... Uh, high achieving schools do use data in a way that informs the instructional decisions of all the educators, the administrators, the teachers, and the specialists. Um, so data does play a role. Um, it should play a role. It does play a role in the highly, most highly effective schools, but we have to know what data we should be collecting, how to collect it, and how to use it well. So several pages in the book um, are devoted to this topic of what are the assessments that the, um, that the research has documented uh, is being done by those highest achieving schools so that we should all be doing that kind of work. Um, and what we know is that the, those screening uh, assessments that lead to the best outcome, those assessments include screening assessments, diagnostic assessments, um, assessments that help us continually evaluate the progress of our students and those that help us measure the outcomes. And let me just say something about how we're using the term diagnosis here today. Um, uh, this is a little different. Here's again, one of the things that makes it challenging. Uh, the term diagnosis, in, even in the field of education, is used differently because, uh, for instance, special educators need to diagnose whether or not a child has uh, some kind of disability to allow them access to special education services. Classroom teachers and many specialists use the term diagnos diagnosis um, more informally, simply um, assessing whether skills, certain students have certain skills and at what level of um, uh, proficiency or mastery have they uh, acquired those skills. So less about labeling and more simply about identifying skill level. Um, those assessments that we call screening assessments, sometimes referred to as benchmark screening assessment or diagnostic or progress monitoring, fit into a category of assessments called formative, simply meaning that we use those along the way as we're designing and providing um, uh, instruction, uh, whereas those outcome assessments are generally categorized as summative. They're used at the end of instruction. Typically in schools these days, end of grade level assessments where we do those larger high stakes assessments. And it's really in our uh, diagnosis and uh, service delivery for our children with dyslexia. It's those formative assessments that we rely on heavily. Um, 
Another idea, though, that is discussed in the book and we need to spend some time thinking about is that the best schools also know uh, that it's not just which assessments you use, but you use them strategically to answer a question. Because um, I certainly hope I make the case strongly in conquering dyslexia. We are all aware in schools that we simply do not have enough time. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people to do the level of uh, instruction, provision of instruction intervention to our students. We have to be strategic. And if we're really strategic around assessments, we know what questions we're asking. We start with that. And then we go find the best, most efficient, uh, uh, most strategic assessments to answer that question. So here are the page numbers if you are following along on that where we're discussing uh, benchmark screening and diagnostic assessments and progress monitoring. And progress monitoring I introduce a bit in chapter three, but because the role of progress monitoring is really uh, a formative instruction, uh, a formative assessment that happens during instruction, I spend more time talking about it later um, in chapter four. But the questions that go along with these assessments, benchmark screening should help us understand who might need some extra help. Who are the kids who are not on track for uh, future success? Uh, and we have a, some wonderful tools that can help us um, in schools uh, assess that quite accurately and quite efficiently. Diagnostic assessments um, are uh, designed to help us answer the question, what kind of help do these students need? Once we found a student who might need some extra help, we turn to the diagnostic assessments, what kind of help do they need? Progress monitoring assessments, um, the question uh, associated with those assessments is, is the work working? Um, meaning that uh, we're teaching children, so the teachers are doing the best job they know. Maybe there's some specialists involved. There's a lot of hard work on the teaching side. There's also a lot of work um, we know with the children trying to learn. Um, is all this hard work working? And we'll certainly spend some more time with that um, at our next session when we talk about uh, instruction and progress monitoring. So the who might need help um, question um, that's we hope to be addressed by benchmark screening assessment is just so essentially important for our students uh, with dyslexia. As, as uh, I started this evening talking about Steve Dykstra um, early on, uh, let's just get started and teach all our children well. So much research. Um, in the chapter one, I talk about the work of uh, Dr. Nadine Gab and, um, and others of her colleagues who are really looking at how early can we possibly assess dyslexia. And it's just uh, the, it, the research just keeps coming in. If we can get started early, if we can identify our students early, uh, we can prevent so many problems from happening. Um, in the book, I also do quote uh, Pamela Snow. Um, who is a researcher yeah, from Australia, writes the brilliant Snow Report blog frequently. Um, and she made this incredible analogy, which I did put into the book, that effective early intervention in reading is like building better fences at the top of the cliff rather than parking ambulances at the bottom. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm reading this and getting some chill chills when I read it because of the power of that statement, the visual of that statement, um, and the uh, uh, the truth of that statement, that uh, prevention is the way we should go. And specifically in reading, the best early intervention uh, is effective instruction. So those assessments, and I did uh, include this quote of hers on page 102 of the book. So those benchmark screening assessments that all schools should be doing are so vitally important. And typically these days, uh, many schools, even during the pandemic where when so much teaching is happening um, virtually, we are trying to still keep up on these benchmark screening, checking our students at least in the fall, in the winter, and the spring to compare their scores using some kind of benchmark screener, comparing those students to a benchmark that has been established and determining which students are at or above benchmark slightly below benchmark or significantly below. 
if they are at or above benchmark, if we've used the right assessment, then with very uh, with good confidence and very quickly, we can determine that they are likely on track. Uh, for the students below, slightly below or significantly below, they may need extra assistance. If they're really significantly below, it's very likely that they do. But we always make sure uh, the best schools also understand that additional assessments should be considered um, to make sure that we are catching all those students as early as possible. So we devote a couple of pages in the book on a very specific and widely used benchmark as, um, assessment called oral reading fluency, often referred to as ORF by its letters, which is essentially the number of words read correctly per minute or before children are reading words in kindergarten and early first grade, we can use this basic assessment of letter sounds, how many letter names or letter sounds do, a, do students correctly identify in a minute. So you may be working at a school that uses uh, one of these assessments or your children may be attending a school that uses these. These are not, this is not a complete uh, list, but these are some of the most widely used commercial assessments that allow um, us to do those ORFs. And these are all um, uh, varying forms of curriculum based measures, and that's where the scientific evidence uh, comes that shows us that these really quick measures, one minute measures, really do have a, a strong scientific evidence of uh, trustworthiness, reliability, validity, gives us important scores. So uh, all of you educators, um, if you're looking for some kind of benchmark screener, this might be a good place to start. And for parents, um, you might ask if your school is doing assessments for benchmark screening like that. So that is the who might need extra help. For our diagnostic assessments, what kind of help do they need? Um, and that progress monitoring is the work working. Um, for tier one, so we really differentiate progress monitoring. We talk about this on page 114 in the book. Uh, we want for our children in tier one, and we discuss these tiers of instruction as uh, MTSS or um, uh, the, it, it, within the book, we talk about uh, response to instruction or MTSS. Tier one essentially being the shorthand uh, way of talking about cl general classroom instruction. And here progress monitoring generally takes the um, takes the role of the daily performance monitoring of children. If we're working with them in small group or breakout groups, how are they seeming to do in their daily performance? Um, if they're doing written work, that's a way to make, uh, to generally, gen make decisions about the quality of their, of their progress. Uh, if, your school or if you in the classroom um, are using some kind of commercially uh, commercial instructional program, they often have built in assessments. And that would be all that would really be necessary. As long as the kids are showing progress, we don't need to do more assessments. For the students who are receiving some extra intervention in what we sometimes refer to and is discussed in the book as tier two or more intensive yet intervention in tier three, um, we might consider going back to those curriculum based measures because oral reading fluency again has many decades of good strong research um, as one tool in the toolkit of assessing students uh, as perhaps monthly, perhaps as frequently as every two weeks and graphing their progress where we have to wait for a while to really make sure that we're seeing um, evidence of progress or lack of progress. But those graphs can be uh, very, very informative to our work. And when we're talking about in the early stages of reading and children who may have dyslexia or do have dyslexia and struggling, it is imperative uh, that we as quickly as possible determine whether our instruction is working. So uh, these graphs are very important and uh, have a use uh, for the teachers themselves to determine whether a student is progressing. Sharing these graphs with parents can be very uh, validating and reassuring. And uh, with students themselves, even really young students, showing them their graphed progress can be um, 
can be encouraging and motivating to students. So I have a few graphs here to show. These do not appear in the book, uh, but we discussed this kind of graphing. So this is an example of a graph over uh, an 11 week period of a little girl in second grade. And this graph, the red line is showing the expected level of progress. And you can just see, even if you know nothing about statistics or anything about these assessments that she's making uh, the progress that we would hope. She's right on track, making steady progress, and that's wonderful. Um, here's another graph, uh, a different child uh, in that same second grade cohort that at the beginning was making steady expected progress and then all of a sudden boom uh, just took off and uh, it's very exciting to see that we don't often see that in schools but we need to respond to that instructionally um, and uh, provide instruction for this child. Here's a student who at the first few weeks of school was not making expected progress. And what this school did um, is had a general rule that every um, after every five assessments, the a group of teachers and specialists would sit together um, and look at the students' graphs. In this case, um, they saw after five weeks of instruction or five data points that the student was not making expected progress. So they made some changes, some modifications in the student's program, um, and that seemed to pay off and the student is now catching back up to where we would expect him to be. Um, and then we have a student like this. Uh, these are all real children um, in a real setting with hardworking teachers who were doing the very best they can. Again, this was a second grade uh, situation. And after five, um, five uh, lessons, five weeks of instruction, uh, uh, the group got together and made some adjustments in the student's uh, instructional program. Uh, and it didn't have the effect that we hope. Five weeks later, there's still minimal effect. And this, what this would trigger, this is, uh, we don't just leave it like this. What we do is do an even deeper dive. And this definitely might be a child that would be flagged as early as possible for a more extensive uh, assessment that might determine, we don't know yet, but might determine that this is indication of dyslexia. If you are intrigued by this, especially those of you who are teachers, educators, uh, specialists, who may be unfamiliar or only minimally familiar with those curriculum-based measurement tools, I uh, definitely want to uh, recommend this book um, by my friends, Michelle and John Hosp and Ken Howell, the second edition of their books, The ABCs of CBM. They go uh, in this book cover more than just reading, um, but uh, I found it to be a very valuable book and not written for statisticians or um, assessment experts, but uh, really is the ABCs of curriculum-based measurement. When we turn our attention to the diagnostic assessments to answer that question, what kind of help do they need? Um, it's usually administered after um, the assessment, uh, the benchmark assessment, and typically used with those students who are not quite at benchmark. And when we talk about, um, in this context, diagnostic assessments, we're talking about assessing these individual skills. How is the student doing with their phonological phonemic awareness, their word identification or phonic skills, uh, their sight word development, their reading fluency, spelling, handwriting, et cetera. Um, and if this list looks somewhat familiar to you, um, that quick look that we had at Scarborough's Rope, it's essentially all those component pieces from the two big areas of language comprehension and word recognition that must be in place. They all must be in place um, to eventually be, we hope, woven together so that students can be strong, uh, efficient, skilled readers. So if they're not making that kind of progress, where is the challenge happening? Which of these areas, and it may be several of the areas, but it's, it's uh, incumbent upon us to do those assessments. What you don't see on this list is rapid automatized naming. Um, and I discuss this more on page 88 of the book. Uh, based on the, um, and I did mention last time that there are many areas uh, of dyslexia now that have um, congruent 
uh, agreement about what we should be doing. And there are areas where there's still strongly held beliefs, uh, but not uh, congruent conclusions. And the assessment of rapid automatized naming or RAN is one of them. I did mention last time that um, of I read extensively widely on uh, research on assessment when I was writing the dyslexia book, but that I kind of decided that I was going to, where there was disagreement, I was going to follow the uh, solid, I think brilliant guidelines of uh, Jack Fletcher and colleagues in his book. And uh, they said in regards to RAN that uh, the relation of rapid naming deficits and reading in individuals with dyslexia remains controversial. So their recommendation was, um, you certainly can take a look at RAN, but it's real um, how we interpret it, whether students are weak or strong in RAN, how we interpret that, uh, we still don't have enough research evidence to include it um, in our assessments. That is not a universal determination. There are many um, state legislations, uh, legislation around dyslexia identification that uh, legally mandate the use of RAN. Um, and they are listening to other researchers when they do that. And Fletcher et al. are not alone. Um, others say the same thing, that the existing evidence, um, at least as of 2006, does not support a persistent core deficit in naming speed for readers with dyslexia. So I've chosen to leave it off um, the assessments. Others will strongly, passionately argue that it needs to be there. Um, nobody is saying it's irrelevant. Um, I think both of these say what I'm thinking is that there simply isn't enough strong uh, convergent evidence to say RAN must be included. So quick view over types of assessments. Again, I'll have a sip of water and see if there are any questions or comments or concerns. Uh, yes, Jan, there are three questions. So I'll start with the first. Um, the first question is the cut point is always where I get questions. Mm -hmm. Since we're categor categorizing continuous variables in order to identify students with dyslexia, how do you think about the cut point question? Yeah. Well, uh, the next part I'm going to talk about, um, and that's a fairly, that's a wonderful question and a technical question. So if uh, parents and others who have less of a assessment or statistical background are not familiar with that term, it's okay. We, we can talk about it in general terms that, that uh, all, many of the assessments that we've talked about, um, uh, the students can perform on a level from uh, zero, they can't do it at all, to highly proficient. And it is rather arbitrary and um, made differently using all kinds of extremely complex statistical processes to determine we're going to say that a performance that is lower than this, <laughs> we're going to count as problematic, uh, uh, an evidence of a disability, um, evidence of dyslexia, uh, whereas another similar test may put the cut score uh, somewhere else. So it is confusing. It is rather arbitrary. Um, another talk that I do that goes into a lot of technical um, issues, uh, I line up a lot of assessments that are almost identical to each other and show how different their cut scores are. Because of that, I think it's very important, and that's the next thing I'm going to be talking about here this evening. It's very important in my mind, and Fletcher et al. and many others would say the same thing, that we not rely on a single test. That's one of the reasons why we're saying there isn't the quick definitive single test that we can say, yes, your child definitively has uh, dyslexia. We have to do multiple assessments across multiple skill areas, and then watch to see is there a preponderance across these skills of low performance. That's what I'm comfortable with, uh, much less than these uh, well-meaning, um, and but even at the end of the day, rather arbitrary cut scores. I hope that was a helpful answer. Uh, we had a second. Oh. Pam, you're muted. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. We do have a few, we do have a few more. Okay. Um, 
Uh, what I think you did, you definitely did address this in the book, but a uh, question about what screeners you recommend. That's the okay. Next yeah. So uh, I, I, in the book, I talk about screeners, but the publisher uh, of Conquering Dyslexia um, asked me not to recommend in the book specific programs or specific assessments for a variety of reasons. Um, and that's fair, but uh, I do think that there are some assessments and here tonight talking about those curriculum-based measures, um, I definitely highly recommend those. And if you're, um, as we go on this evening with the time we have left, I'm going to talk about some other assessments um, and, uh, I really think that uh, there are many wonderful ones. There are very few, um, aside from those, uh, a good use of an appropriate use of curriculum based measures, um, there are many phonics assessments. There are many good um, uh, diagnostic assessments of, of phonics and decoding. There are many good uh, assessments of spelling and handwriting and reading fluency. So um, I'm I'm less comfortable uh, talking about specific assessments, recommending those. But um, if you want to follow up, if you feel like you're really on the hunt for something or your school is using one and you're wondering if it's good, if you would contact me um, through email um, or start on Twitter, we can go from there. I'd be happy to do that uh, more privately. Okay, next question. Does the book discuss how to figure out what grade level of probes to use for progress monitoring? No, well, my book doesn't, uh, but uh, conquering uh, the ABCs, excuse me, the ABCs of CBM help with that decision because um, we use grade level assessments for the screening decisions, but uh, once we get to progress monitoring, that decision is a little bit more um, uh, complicated, and the ABCs of CBM can help you with that. Okay, next question. Do you have any suggestions for diagnostic assessments? There are so many out there. There are so many out there. So to uh, reiterate again, tonight, I'm not, I, I think there are many that are good. Um, and I don't really want to go out on a limb to say this one or that one, If, but I'd be happy to engage in a dialogue with any of you um, and make some general recommendations. So send me an email. Okay, um, next question. Is RAN, RAN is tricky because if there's a deficit, it is fairly static and there's no solid remediation question. Or is the use of RAN for assessing dyslexia unclear? Um, I would say both. I think one of the reasons that those people, Jack Fletcher and colleagues included, and others who are a little equivocal around RAN, um, do make that point that the, the lack of evidence is in part that what do you do with RAN? Uh, you've got a low RAN score. There is no evidence that we can then turn around and do, okay, let's start a, a rapid naming intervention this afternoon and fix that. It's not the same as I give a phonics assessment. Your, uh, your phonics skills are weak in these areas. That afternoon, we can turn around and start doing very appropriately um, an, an intervention that can help address that. We can do that with fluency. We can do that with phonemic awareness. We can do that with phonics and decoding. Um, so it's those assessments where we can essentially um, use that information to design our instruction um, is going to be a better use of our time. Um, somebody has already ordered the ABC book. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> <the questions>. Good. <laughs> and um, this next question again has to do with screeners. Um, what screeners do you recommend for automatic word recognition and listening comprehension? And any of those that, yeah, any of those that I listed before, the, the uh, University of Oregon Dibbles assessment, Acadians, Easy CBM, FAST, um, uh, any of those on the list. They all have good assessments um, and, and are valuable for those kind of screening. Very valuable. Um, folks are asking for your email address. <laughs> Oh, I think I put it on the last slide, but it okay. is, uh, it is uh, Jan Hasbrook at gmail.com. Hasbrook being that weird spelling, but it's right there on the book. You can figure it out. Jan Hasbrook at gmail.com. So I'm going to go ahead and Pam. Yeah. Okay. I just want to be sure we cover all this and I do want to end on time. So, so what do we do about this? Um, in the book, I include this checklist and talk about essentially a step-by-step, -step, um, along with this visual of 
my philosophy and the my belief in what the strongest research says that the best identification of dyslexia is multifaceted, not relying on one uh, uh, assessment with an arbitrary cut score, but we see patterns of skill weaknesses, those skills that we associate with dyslexia. So um, I created this um, checklist. I believe I sent a PDF to be shared with people too, um, and that can be put in the, in the chat as well tonight, um, or I can make sure that you get one when we uh, post the video of uh, the recording of tonight's session. But all of these things would need to be assessed. There are many different commercially available, excellent assessments that uh, can be used for all of these things. We assess the student, then we make a determination if it's a concern, then we make a determination. And this is rather informal because of that concern that was raised earlier about, about uh, uh, cut scores and benchmarks. Make a determination for this child in your school setting. Is it a mild concern, a moderate concern, or a severe concern? In a real sort of arbitrary, I know about kids, I, I, I know I know my belief system. So in the book, um, uh, I have a scenario um, of Emily. And I said that Emily was this child that is attending a new school. It's in the fall. Uh, her parents, as they check her in and register her with the school, raised the issue that last year in first grade that she struggled a bit with learning to read, um, that the teacher had, has, had mentioned that perhaps Emily was having some um, challenges around reading and writing and spelling. And so uh, right away, the parents asked if Emily could be um, assessed. And so the reading specialist in this scenario did an assessment and found that uh, Emily did have some concerns in phonological and phonemic awareness. And the uh, reading teacher indicated in her mind that this was a severe level concern. Also some concerns, yes, a concern with phonics and decoding at a moderate level. Sight words, yes, a concern at a moderate level. Reading fluency, yes, a concern determined by the reading specialist to be severe. No problems with listening comprehension, which is very typical of our children with dyslexia, uh, able to understand and, and make sense of text that far more difficult than they can read. Uh, yes, a concern was spelling, but the reading specialist determined that it, it was a moderate level. No concern with handwriting, no concern with language proficiency. Um, in uh, some kind of perhaps uh, interview or questionnaire, it was determined that there was a family history of reading difficulty or dyslexia. Many times when we talk to family members, they may not have been formally diagnosed as having dyslexia. Um, so they may use terms like, yes, reading was hard for me, or uh, I dropped out of school or something like that. So uh, the teacher put X's in mo both moderate and severe. Um, and has appropriate instruction been provided? Because um, Emily could show up at the beginning of second grade struggling with all these things, and it might just be that she hadn't had adequate instruction. And the um, evidence provided by the parents as well as uh, the records that came with Emily sh showed that it had. So in this case, the remainder of that scenario was that the reading specialist sat down with the parents and said, uh, it appears that your student, uh, your child, Emily, does likely have dyslexia. And we always hope that the next sentence that comes out of the teacher's uh, mouth would be, and here's what we're going to do about it. That is best case scenario, because what we know in the real world is that many of our students have to go through all kinds of other, I'll just call them hoops. They have to be assessed formally by somebody who's designated as being able to give that diagnosis and without that more formal determination, um, which can be very hard to get. All you parents out there may know that where you have to, the school is very reluctant to do that or they have no mechanism for doing that. Um, and then that forces parents to go outside the school system and often pay an extraordinary amount of money to somebody to do those assessments and make that determination. And even then um, that outside determination may not be used by the school to provide instruction. And my hope 
my dream, my wish is that every school gets so informed about uh, what dyslexia is and how we can intervene. Um, and we must intervene as early as possible that these kind of informal assessments like I'm showing you here uh, will be sufficient to say, okay, Emily's very weak in her phonemic and phonological awareness. Let's start an intervention this afternoon um, uh, to address that. Uh, that's what we should be doing. Going back to what Steve Dykstra said, let's not wait till we have a formal diagnosis. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Emily has dyslexia or not. At this early stage, let's just intervene. Once we have um, diagnostic uh, results, talk about this on page 93, this is what should happen there should be a clear and understandable explanation of how this diagnosis was determined, um, how, uh, what it means, um, connecting the parents and children with all the resources available uh, that would provide that ongoing family support. Let them know right away um, if uh, their state, we hope every state, uh, the decoding dyslexia family support groups um, and all the things that may be available at the school level or the district level, uh, the state or region, get sure, make sure that families connected with that immediately. And the most important, right away, making sure that appropriate intervention is provided um, as early as possible. That's the very best thing we can do. That's what all schools should be doing, um, uh, rather than these hoops and jumps and ladders and shoots and <laughs> ladders that we put families through, uh, because uh, that's not uh, acceptable. It's not appropriate. It's not helpful. Um, it breaks my heart when I see that in place. And uh, certainly one of the reasons I wrote the book Conquering Dyslexia is to empower all of uh, everyone who reads it, whether you're coming at this from the education side or the family side or both as I did, uh, that you're empowered with some uh, ideas and resources to take back to the school. Um, at the back of the book, and I think I'll talk about this more in our last session, are those checklists. Um, and those were uh, designed for educators or parents to use to visit the school, to talk about what their current practices are around assessment and around instruction um, so that you can um, at least begin by having a conversation. Uh, and what should the next steps be? Um, talk about this somewhat on page 96. And this is where uh, we have to start talking about policies and regulations that vary uh, by school district, agency, um, state, and region. Uh, so some people provide dyslexia programs outside of special education in some areas. Um, others, it has to happen within a formal diagnosis of a learning disabilities and dyslexia is treated only through those special uh, services through IDEA regulations. And these are all issues that relate to how we do things for better or worse uh, in the United States. Um, so, Assessment results. Uh, this is the final stopping point for us uh, on questions. So I, I, just to make sure we have uh, enough time, I'm gonna take us to the slide. And here are the dates and times um, where the follow-up discussions, and I bet they're gonna be good, rich, helpful discussions um, on Tuesday, February 2nd, and Thursday, um, February 4th. And these are going to be facilitated by uh, the wonderful folks in Pennsylvania. And once again, um, if you're a parent and the educator discussion night works better for you, feel free. If you want to come to both, feel free. If you're an educator and you want to listen in on what the parents are saying, um, it's not hard and fast rule. You don't have to show your parent identification to uh, attend that group. Um, and I do hope that you'll be able to join us for the uh, final uh, meeting, uh, the final discussion of the chapter, we'll have one bonus session afterwards where we'll just have a free for all open discussion on any questions that you have about dyslexia. But February 9th, I'll be back to do a walk through chapters four and five. So I'll just leave it on this. Oh, I did not include my um, email address on this, but you can uh, check me out on Gmail or look forward to talking with you at Twitter. So whatever time we have left, Pam, I'm happy to take questions. 
Okay, we do have some left. <laughs> um, question, uh, do you think timed site word and nonsense word lists are important or are untimed lists more valuable? Uh, for assessment, we know that timing assessment, um, as uh, challenging as that can be for our students with dyslexia, so we hope those time tests are really short. One of the reasons I'm such a fan of those curriculum-based measures, because most of those are one-minute assessments. Um, I don't want to put children through any more uh, assessment agony than we need to, but we need that data. We need that data for all those decisions. Who needs help? What kind of help do they need, and are they making progress. So the timed test is a huge issue. Many of our children with dyslexia have are so smart and so resourceful and work so hard and they will work as hard as they can to get the right answer and we count it right. But it took them several seconds to get to that right answer, whereas a child, a neurotypical child would have addressed it instantaneously. So it's those patterns of not only accuracy, but the rate of, of accuracy uh, performance is so vital to us. So I hope those of you who um, uh, question the use of time tests, but once we've got that information, then we take it to the instructional level where we always start with accuracy, always first, and then as, uh, as appropriate to the age of the child, to the level of disability of the child, to the emotional fortitude of the child, we bring in, we must layer in for the ultimate success, we must layer in what we would think of as automaticity, that foundation of accuracy, but rate plays a role in all of these skills. If you think about Scarborough's rope and that tightly woven ending there, um, you don't get there uh, unless um, there is that level of, of automaticity, which is the rate added to, um, added to the accuracy. So we need to be doing that. We have to do it as part of our assessments, but keep that as minimal as possible and then strategically Human, humanistically, uh, humanely added into our instruction because it is necessary. And, uh, and admittedly, right now, let's just say a huge challenge for our students with dyslexia. We know that. Um, next question. Do you feel as if RAN triggers you to look at language? It can, depending on the assessment. There are RAN assessments that are language free. In fact, I think uh, most of the most popular RAN assessments have uh, the responses are uh, not based on language so that we take that variable out. Uh, so RAN assessments cover the gamut. Um, next question. Any recommendations for screening or diagnostic assessments above eighth grade? For screening assessments, um, we, def we depend less on screening assessments for our older students uh, for the reason, if you recall, that the question that is uh, answered by screening assessments is who needs help. By the time our students are in eighth grade, um, and it's obvious that they cannot read um, and understand and benefit from grade level text, uh, we have found them. We don't need to screen um, uh, screening is, becomes much less of an issue. What becomes a big issue across the board, no matter what age the student, are those diagnostic assessments. Where is the student with his or her phonemic awareness? And this is a relatively, just that alone is a relatively new understanding um, for many of us in the reading field. Um, what I, when I was taught to be a reading specialist many decades ago, we did not assess for phonemic awareness at all. It was all about phonics. We would assess phonics um, and determine whether the student was weak and uh, uh, not as solidly skilled in phonics and we would start teaching phonics. What we now understand because of decades of research and our deeper understanding is that phonics are not going to be um, uh, children cannot become proficient in phonics, which is necessary uh, if they don't have proficiency in phonemic awareness. So even with eighth graders or adults, uh, we should assess if they're struggling with reading, likely struggling with phonics, we should assess phonemic awareness. So that whole list of assessments on that, dis, uh, on that diagnosis assessment checklist are relevant for our older students. Um, if an eighth grader is struggling or a student at eighth grade or above is struggling um, with any of those things, that's where we do the intervention. 
Uh, Jan, since you just brought up charts, I'll just ask this question, and then there's one more left. Um, do you have a PDF of the chart on page 92 and the one that was shared uh, from page 163? Are there PDFs available of those? There are, um, and I am not skillful enough to dive into my computer right now and get them, so I will find a way through all of the support teams to make sure they get uh, access to everybody. Right. Um, as you recall, we're going to create a Padlet, so we'll make sure that it gets on the There screen. we go. Okay. Pam Kastner and her favorite <laughs> famous Padlets. There you go. <laughs> so, we're so grateful. <laughs> and then one uh, last question. What are Excellent. your thoughts on a public library offering screening tests other than training staff properly? What would be other barriers? Well, with my practical pragmatic mind, I don't see any barriers other than people coming in with their issues about legality and all of those kinds of things. I do know that um, uh, there are uh, some pediatricians who have taken upon themselves to learn how to do some of those simple language and uh, decoding, if you will, uh, assessments in their pediatric office. And I know that's one of the things that uh, Dr. Uh, Gab is talking about, making sure these assessments get in the hands of everyone who comes in touch with uh, young children so we can do that quick screening as quickly as possible. But I always have to say that uh, I guess the other downside, if we screen children and then don't have some way for them to access appropriate intervention, it can just leave everybody uh, very frustrated. So uh, we would want to be sure that there are resources to send those families if we say, it does look like your child uh, might be struggling with reading perhaps because of dyslexia. And here's where you can go to get the help. Those were all the questions and uh, what we're seeing Wonderful. in the chat box. There's lots of thank you, thank you, thank yous to you. Oh, and mutual back to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. I hope to see you um, next time uh, when we discuss chapter four and five. And I hope you take advantage of the wonderful supportive chat uh, conversations and discussion groups too. So good night, everybody. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so Wonderful much. Night. Thank I you. I really appreciate it. Take Fantastic. care. Bye-bye. Yeah.